I now call to order the society's 2,471st meeting in what is now the 151st year since its founding on March 13th, 1871. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members, guests and friends, including everyone here in the Powell Auditorium at the Cosmos Club, and everyone tuning in on Zoom and on YouTube to tonight's lecture by Thomas Zerberchen and Nadia Drake. Tonight is the occasion of the annual President's Lecture, and we honor this event by using the Society's ceremonial gavel, hewn from the timbers of the White House in its rebuilding after it was burned to the ground by our good friends of the British <laughs> in the War of 1812, proving that old enemies can become close allies. The wood used to make the gavel was recovered from the White House when it was rebuilt during the administration of Harry S. Truman after World War II. The Society is grateful to the full year series sponsors, PSW member Mike Helton and Helton Associates, the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University for their support, and PSW Spring Lecture Series sponsor, our very own PSW member, Tim Thomas. And finally, the sponsor of tonight's lecture, the IP law firm of Mill and White, Solano and Brannigan, where I just happen to be a partner. <laughs> uh, let's thank them all for their support. <laughs> Speaking of sponsors, <clears throat> As mentioned at the last meeting, the Society has begun a fundraising campaign to ensure that it will be able to meet expenses in the coming year without having to reduce the number of meetings and lectures and without having to spend down its reserves. The goal was to raise at least $20,000 more in dues, contributions, and sponsorships than was raised in previous years, and actually hopefully $25,000. I'm happy to say that campaigns had considerable success, although there is still a ways to go. So please, if you can afford to contribute by sponsoring a lecture series or an individual lecture, please let me know. And even if you cannot contribute financially, let us know if you know of anyone or any organization you know who might be interested to support the society. Feel free to email me at president at pswscience.org. And keep in mind, we have to keep up this level of financial support, not just this year, but in the coming years. So please, insofar as you have been contributing, continue to do so. Tonight is the annual President's Lecture, by the way. And I am pleased to announce the following new members. Oops, what's going on here? Yes, Mark Coles, a physicist with NSF, interested in elementary particle physics and gravitational wave detection, who learned of PSW by word of mouth. Zachary Elowitz, director of data science at WEX, interested in quantum computing, physics, and mathematics, who learned of PSW from a Google search. Ryan Murray, a physician in private practice, interested in planetary science, biology, and I quote, Everything smart, engaging, and novel. <laughs> Who learned a PSW from a friend. Stephen O'Regan, an engineer with the US Navy, interested in physics, mathematics, artificial intelligence, archaeology, and sociology. Who learned a PSW from a current member. And Undine Nash, a visitor services specialist at the Library of Congress interested in molecular biology and ecology, who learned in PSW as follows. Quote, I inquired about Joseph Henry, whose statue is in the main reading room of the Library of Congress. 
Together with Isaac Newton, he represents the field of science. I was delighted to learn that the scientific society that Joseph Henry had founded is still active, <laughs> as are we all. And tonight's speakers, Nadia Drake, who learned her PSW from an invitation to her to speak here tonight, and whose interests will be clear in part from tonight's lecture, and Thomas Zerberchen, who actually already is a member by virtue of his having given a previous lecture on eclipses. We welcome them all to membership. If you are not a member and would like to join PSW or support the society, you can do so easily through the PSW website using the blue join button on the upper right hand corner of the home page. We welcome new members and appreciate donations. All members are entitled to wear the PSW rosette. The rosette is $15 plus 90 cents DC sales tax. They can be purchased in online or at the rosette table in the back of the room. Please note that rosettes must be picked up in person at a lecture here in the Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club because we cannot keep track of all of the tax collection rules of all the states to which we might be mailing the ribbons. <laughs> and believe it or not, we actually do have to pay DC sales tax on every $15 ribbon we sell, which I believe is amounted to, uh, I don't know, $40 last year. Recording secretary, Camille Lance, who has somehow managed to get here from Norway, We'll now read the minutes of the 2470th meeting and the lecture by Lily Chen on post-quantum cryptography. Tamio, welcome. Why miss a PSW event if you don't have to? On January 20th, 2023, from the Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., and by Zoom webinar broadcast on the PSW Science YouTube channel, President Larry Milstein called together the 2,470th meeting of the Society to Order at 8.01 p.m. He welcomed new members, and the recording secretary read the minutes of the previous meeting. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Lily Chen, a mathematician who heads the Cryptographic Technology Group and the Computer Security Division at the National Institute of Standards, or NIST, Standards and Technology, or NIST, where she leads the development of cryptographic standards. Her lecture was titled, Post-Quantum Cryptography, Cornerstone for Security in the Coming Quantum Computing Era. The speaker began by introducing NIST as a research institute which has produced five Nobel Prize winners and pointed out that NIST has been involved with cryptographic standards since the 1970s. Chin continued by discussing the differences between cryptography and encryption by reviewing the fundamentals of symmetric key cryptography. Security of encryption is based on a key shared, she explains, by two communicators and the authentication algorithm is public. In World War II, this, the speaker pointed out, this key was distributed through secret channels. The need for a secret channel was removed in the 1970s with the invention of public key cryptography. Shortly thereafter, in 1978, a paper establishing the RSA encryption method based on factorization was published. This method is still being used today to assist in establishing public key cryptography to secure communications. Chen then moved on to discuss the relationship between research, standards, and applications of quantum cryptography. Cryptography is a research area, Chen explains, so only mature methods inform standards. The standards apply to security and interoperability. Applications of these standards are broken into four categories, public key-based tools, 
symmetric key-based tools and guidelines for how to use tools and operating using standards. Chen reviewed some difficulties associated with the math for the keys and discussed fundamental changes in the field, such as in 1994 when the calculation regime changed after an MIT professor, Peter Shore, changed a quantum algorithm which exponentially sped up the computation of factoring large integers. The speaker then transitioned to discussing the active research area of post-quantum cryptography. Thousands of papers have been published in the past decade, Chen points out. Within these papers, there are several main categories, including lattice-based, code-based, multivariate, hash, symmetric key-based signatures, and elliptic curve isogeny-based. <laughs> Chen then comments that there is, a co there is a one in five chance that some fundamental public key cryptography will be broken by 2029. She then shows agreement that quantum computers will be able to break RSA 2048 in, in 24 hours in approximately 20 years. She concludes that within this time frame there should be an upgrade to quantum resistant tech cryptography methods. The speaker then discussed the challenges of finding quantum resistant algorithms and explained that NIST calls for proposals to identify such algorithms. Chin continued by describing the ongoing efforts which have been opened up to participants around the world. Chen concluded with summarizing a plan to release a draft of standards for public comments prior to final finalization of the first of the quantum cryptography standards which is to be published in 2024. Next, the question and answer period began. One of the members asked about the relationship NIST has with NSA, the National Security Agency, which has primary cryptographic responsibility for military and intelligence agencies. Chen responded by noting that NSA and NIST have different missions. Her work with NIST is open, a worldwide effort, and the National Security Agency has their own standards, and they cannot participate in the open procedures. A question from a member participating through the web asked about compatibility of the PQC standards with the IPv6. Chen responded that she does not know specifically for the IPv6, but they have tested them with TOS transport. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. President Milstein adjourned the meeting at 9.44 p.m. The temperature in Washington, D.C. was 5 degrees Celsius. The weather was partly cloudy. The attendance in person was 59, concurrent live stream viewers of 39, for a total live viewership of 98 persons. And in the number of online viewers in the first two weeks of posting was 199. Respectfully submitted, Camille Lance, Recording Secretary. Thank you, Cameo. Do we have any comments or corrections on the minutes? I think I'd just make one ad addition, which is uh, um, Lily reported that uh, the first release of a proposed cryptographic uh, quantum resistant uh, <clears throat> standard was cracked in about a day by five different groups. So. And uh, they also had a discussion about NSA and um, not being able to actually talk to NSA much, but she did, somebody related a story, might be here tonight, of uh, submitting to NSA uh, a whole bunch of hash tables, like a couple of thousand, and asking uh, which ones they should use. And NSA came back and said, well, you should use these 12, but don't use any of the other ones. And they were scratching their heads for a long time about whether that was because NSA could break the 12 or it was because the other ones weren't so hot. And about five years later, somebody published a way to break all the other ones, but not the 12. So maybe you can uh, add that to the minutes when you, uh, <clears throat> before we post them. But thank you, Cameo. And subject to that correction, or addition, not a correction, uh, do I have a motion by a member to accept the minutes? So moved. Do I have a second? second? All members in favor? Aye. All opposed? The minutes are accepted as read, subject to the addition, and will be posted to the website in due course. 
We now turn to tonight's lecture by Thomas DeBurchin and Nadia Drake on Whispers from Other Worlds, NASA's Search for Life in the Cosmos. Thomas is the longest continually serving NASA Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate, having served for six years until the end of 2022. During his tenure at NASA, NASA launched 37 science missions and started 54. Among those that were launched are the James Webb Telescope, two Mars landings, the Ingenuity helicopter, the Parker Solar Probe, and the DART mission, as well as the Earth System Observatory, which he conceived and led. He's an author on over 200 publications, focused on solar and heliospheric physics, experimental space research, and space systems, among other honors and awards. He's a member of the Swiss Academy of Engineering Sciences, recipient of the NASA Outstanding Service Medal, Associate Fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and recipient of the Presidential Rank Award Distinguished Level. Thomas earned an MS in Physics, Mathematics, and Astronomy and a PhD in Physics at the University of Bern in Switzerland. Nadia Drake is a freelance science journalist and contributing writer at National Geographic. She specializes in covering astronomy, astrophysics, and planetary science, as well as anything involving jungles and spiders. Her byline has appeared in The Atlantic, Nature, The New York Times, Science News, Wired, and Scientific American, for which she recently led coverage of NASA's Artemis I moon mission as well as at Nat Geo. Natty has won many awards for her work, including recognition from the American Astronomical Society's Divisions of Planetary Science and High Energy Astrophysics. She earned a BA in Biology, Psychology, and Dance, and a PhD in Genetics at Cornell University. She also holds a Graduate Certificate in Science Communication from UC Santa Cruz. All questions will be fielded after the lecture during the Q&A session. Nadia, Thomas, the stage is yours. I'm uh, really excited to uh, uh, kick this off. And uh, you may ask, why did you bring uh, Nadia on stage? Uh, there's a number of answers. Of course, the first one is, at least we have one name we can pronounce. <laughs> uh, the second one may be, uh, I don't like when people look at me. Uh, so. <laughs> So with her up there, that will not happen very often. Uh, and I think uh, the third reason is because uh, together uh, we can tell the story about life in, in, in the universe like nobody else can, I would believe. And frankly, what you see is not only our first talk we're giving together today, but you also get to hear the first talk uh, by Nadia and uh, frankly representing not only as uh, her family, the Drake family, uh, but also, the, uh, also herself, of course, with her uh, distinguished career focused on that after her father passed away, uh, frankly, uh, just in, in September. It's my first uh, talk after I left the science programs at NASA. Uh, which for the first time was spilled with a paradigm and with a, uh, with, the, uh, with a legal basis of actually looking for life elsewhere. And so what I want to tell you here, and uh, what we want to tell you together are really two stories. The first one is the history of imagining this amazing and so important uh, science field. And the second one is a progress update on what has happened since 1961 when that uh, field was conceived by Nadia's father. And, uh, and I want to show you uh, all the progress that has occurred, frankly, stunning achievements. Uh, but the most important thing you should get from it is that the best is yet to come. Because uh, this team, uh, some of the proponents are here sitting in the audience. Uh, and frankly, we already, Nadia and I already agreed we we're going to bounce some of the questions in the audience because the experts are sitting here, uh, experts that are deeper in many of the areas than we are. 
But what you're going to see, uh, even in this presentation, that some of the most amazing kind of machines focused on life in the universe are ready to be conceived and are actually being invented as we speak. Does that make sense as a plan? So that's for one hour, uh, that's what we're going to do, and kind of hand back and forth. Uh, but what I'd like to do uh, at the beginning is, frankly, ask for a moment of silence from all of you for uh, Professor Dr. Frank Drake, uh, who left this earth after an amazing career as a scientist, but also as a husband, as a father, and as a friend. I want to tell you my story about being excited about this field. And uh, by the way, if you uh, walk out the house where I grew up in the Swiss mountains, that's where my accent is from, as you already heard. And no, I tried very hard to get rid of it, and I don't seem to be successful, so I gave up. Um, uh, when you look, just walk out a little bit and look to the left, you see those mountains. And I spent a lot of time looking out there. Eiger is to the left, the one with the famous north face uh, that you've read about. Uh, uh, Jungfrau is to the right, uh, which is the highest train station in Europe uh, that you can go up there, not to the top, but uh, at the bottom. Uh, I didn't really focus on the mountain so much. I focused on the sky above it. I grew up in that little town with very dark skies. And I want to tell you, the skies are amazing, and it changed my life looking at these skies. Because uh, what I imagined and what I started to learn about once I re read books is the immensity of that cosmos, but also the beauty of the cosmos. Uh, that these dots that were out there were worlds all by themselves. And I remember distinctly, even early on, when I, before I even had any of the higher education, thinking about life elsewhere. Was there a boy somewhere, a girl somewhere, somebody looking in the other direction from that depth of that cosmos and wondering what happened on that earth, that world down there that is there? So for me, I've been very, from the moment from that youth, I've been very excited about this. And I want to tell you what I didn't expect is how much in my professional lifetime this question would leap forward. So that's my story. How about yours? Thank you, Thomas. So like Thomas, I formed an early connection with the question of whether we are alone in the universe for obvious reasons, as you've heard, my dad is Frank Drake. Um, this is a relatively recent picture of the two of us. <laughs> and so my early years were filled with his curiosity and his sense of wonder, um, his wit. He had a very often hilarious, let's try it and see what happens attitude to solving problems. And I learned a lot from him about his motivations for looking for extraterrestrial civilizations. I also watched as he forged ahead on that quest, um, often alone, but sometimes with moderate success at recruiting people to join him on that journey. But it wasn't until I became a science journalist and actually serendipitously kind of fell into astronomy reporting that I could begin to understand the complexity of what he was trying to do and to appreciate his impact on the field as well as, perhaps even more importantly, to understand the nuances of astrobiology, the challenges involved in looking for life beyond Earth in the many different ways that that's being done today. And so I thought it would be kind of amusing to put up actually the very first story I ever wrote about looking for life in the solar system, which happens to be among the icy moons in the outer solar system. This was a story that was published in Science News in 2011, and it absolutely turned my brain into a pretzel when I was writing it. But it also introduced me to a bunch of very interesting questions that I haven't been able to stop thinking about ever since. And so over the last 12 years as a reporter, I would say I've had a front row seat to a lot of incredibly cool science discoveries in the field of astrobiology. But I've also been able to witness what I would say is a fairly dramatic shift in how astrobiology and the search for life beyond Earth are regarded um, among the scientific community as well as others. And so that's the perspective that I'd like to approach today's presentation from, one that tells you what it's like for me as a journalist to witness the last decade in planetary science and astrobiology. But we're going to actually re rewind the clock a little bit and start earlier, because I'm going to tell you a little bit of my dad's story 
as well. And for those of you who noticed, I'm going to go back, um, I put the Pleiades as the background on the slide because that was one of Dad's favorite star clusters. I actually almost ended up being named after one of these stars. So 60 years ago, in the late 1950s, when Dad was thinking about starting his first search for extraterrestrial civilizations, I think it's fair to say that looking for life beyond Earth wasn't generally regarded within a scientific framework, unless you were one of a handful of people who still thought that there might be life currently existing on Mars. That was a very tenacious idea that stuck around for a while and produced some interesting results, which is why I have this abstract here, which still kind of amuses me. Aside from that, and the very notable um, example of Kokoni and Morris in this paper down here, um, I think it's fair to say that people were interested in the question. People were certainly interested in the concepts of flying saucers and UFOs, but nobody was really thinking about how to go about looking for life beyond Earth in a scientific way. And so what we, said, we, what we tended to see was that people sort of passively sat around and waited for what would fly overhead or, if you want, crash to Earth. Luckily, Dad was a little bit different. Um, he'd started thinking about looking for life in the cosmos when he was a kid. He was growing up in Chicago in the 1930s. And his dad, my grandfather, happened to mention that there were other worlds out there. And my grandfather meant the other worlds in the solar system, because at that point we didn't know of any planets orbiting any stars other than the sun. But Dad didn't know that, and to him, other worlds out there meant other worlds like Earth, places that might have civilizations like ours, places that he might one day be able to find. Because it just made sense to him that Earth wouldn't be alone. That seemed like a very weird concept. And so he started thinking about how to detect extraterrestrial civilizations. And in 1960, about 25 years later, he got his first chance to try. Now, at that point, Dad was a staff astronomer at the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia, and he had convinced the observatory's director to give him a whole $2,000 for the search that he called Project Ozma, which he named after Princess Ozma and the Oz series of books, which he had loved reading when he was a kid. And Dad's plan was to aim the observatory's 85-foot Tatal Telescope at two nearby sun-like stars um, called Epsilon Arytony and Tau Ceti. And what Dad had reasoned was that if these stars were orbited by planets that were somewhat like the Earth, and that if those planets had civilizations that were somewhat like ours, then maybe, like us, they were sending radio transmissions into space that were distinctly artificial. And he had calculated that the Tatal Telescope would be powerful enough to detect those transmissions. And so he'd blocked off 150 hours over something like three or four months. He scanned the skies around those two stars, and he came up with absolutely nothing. Otherwise, we would all know about it. And years later, he said to me that that was a disappointment. But he began to realize that's just the way the universe was, and they were just going to have to look harder. So even though Project Ozma didn't find anything, it was still foundational. And I would also say it was inspirational. And more than that, it attracted a lot of attention from the media. And so the next year, in 1961, when Dad was in DC, he was actually giving a talk at the Philosophical Society of Washington's meeting. He was approached afterward by a representative from the National Academy of Sciences who asked him to organize a meeting at Green Bank to talk about the scientific search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And so that year, he did. Again, it was 1961. The meeting was set for the fall, and as it was approaching, he realized he was in a little bit of a pickle because he didn't have a meeting agenda, and he had these people coming into town for three days, and they had to come up with something to talk about. So he needed some way to plan these conversations. He found a quiet spot, which isn't hard in Green Bank, and he decided he was just going to write down what he thought were a bunch of interesting discussion topics. And when he looked at what he'd written down, he realized that he had put together a list of factors that were important not only for life's ability to gain a foothold in the cosmos, but for our ability to detect it. And when he arranged them in a particular order, he had this formula which we now know as the Drake Equation. 
So I think for a lot of us, this is actually a very recognizable formula. And that's actually something that amused and surprised dad for the rest of his life. Because that day in Green Bank, he thought he was just writing a meeting agenda. <laughs> So what I'm going to do next, I think we'll just run through each of these factors um, quickly. And then I'm going to talk with you about what we're doing to pin values on each of these factors. Moving from left to right, um, we'll talk about the first three. We're going to pause at F sub L, and then Thomas is going to take over and tell you about what NASA is doing there. Then we're going to circle back around. We're going to talk about the last three, the farthest on the right, which are actually the most confusing, where there's a lot of questions that we still need to answer. So very briefly, n is equal to the number of detectable civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy, and that's actually very specifically defined. That's equal to our star, um, the average rate of star formation in the galaxy, multiplied by the fraction of those stars that have planetary systems, multiplied by the average number of habitable planets per planetary system, multiplied by the fraction of those planets that go on to evolve life, multiplied by the fraction of that life that goes on to evolve intelligence, however you want to define that, multiplied by the fraction of those civilizations that evolve communicative technologies, and then you get to L, which is the average length time that a civilization is detectable for. And so what's interesting to me is that when dad first wrote this equation down, the only factor that he kind of knew the value for was R star, and the rest of them were pretty much total mysteries. So our star today, um, well, in 1961, the value for that they thought was basically one. On average, one sun-like star was formed in the Milky Way galaxy per year. Today, uh, based on additional observations, we think that number might be a little bit higher. It might be three, it might be five, it could be 10. But if you, if you know, which we do, that habitable planets don't just orbit sun-like stars, and you include other types of stellar populations, and that number gets even higher. So for example, we might want to think about how many M dwarfs are born per year in the Milky Way. Um, we know that habitable planets orbit those stars. They're dim, they're red, they're small, um, but they're also the, one of the most common stellar types in the galaxy. So the next two factors, the fraction of stars that have planets and the average number of um, habitable planets per planetary system. Um, these are two that I think in the last decade or so we've really been able to nail down. And to me, that's a very interesting thing. So remember, again, when dad wrote this equation, we knew of no planets orbiting stars other than the sun. That was it. Today, we know that the value for F sub P is essentially one. That on average, 100% of stars have at least one planet in orbit that when you go outside at night and you look up at the sky, on average, every single star that you see has at least one planet. And to me, this is a really, really cool result. And it actually took shape during my lifetime as a science reporter. Not my lifetime on Earth, but just the amount of time that I've been in this career, which again is about a decade. And I think that's very cool. Um, one of the major contributors to this understanding was NASA's Kepler mission, which launched in 2009. And it put a telescope in space specifically for the purpose of finding exoplanets. And so for Kepler's primary mission, it stared at a single patch of star-studded sky with 150,000 stars for four years. And it looked for the brief blips in starlight that occur when a planet passes between its star and Earth. And this is an animation of how that looks. And based on those twinkles, scientists can figure out how big a planet is. They can figure out its radius. Um, they also know its orbital period. So over those years and a subsequent mission, Kepler found thousands of planets, like literally thousands. And based on those statistics, as well as some from the test mission, scientists were able to determine that Again, on average, basically every star has at least one planet in orbit. But Kepler's goal from the very beginning was to find out how common Earths are. Kepler was chasing a value called eta Earth, which is defined as um, the frequency of Earth-sized planets that orbit sun-like stars in a zone where the temperature is right for liquid water to be stable on their surface. So it's a pretty specific definition. And it turned out that finding Eta Earth was a little bit trickier than anticipated for reasons I'm not going to go into now. And that the values we currently have for Eta Earth are, are pretty broad. <laughs> so early in the Kepler mission, uh, scientists were estimating that maybe one out of every four sun-like stars, one out of every five 
had an earthy planet in orbit. Then in 2020, there was a paper published that combined data from ESA's Gaia spacecraft with Kepler data and suggested that maybe one out of every two, so half of sun-like stars, have an Earth in orbit. And that comes, about to, that comes out to 300 million or 400 million Earths in the galaxy. And then recently, we heard Jesse Christensen at the AAS meeting saying that estimates for Eta Earth right now are between 15 and 100%. <laughs> so, so it's quite a range. Um, but the big message here is that it's not zero, right? So even if there's a small fraction of sun-like stars that have Earths, there are still a lot of Earths. And this number relates somewhat to um, n sub e, the next variable in the equation, which is the average number of habitable planets per planetary system. Now, when Dad wrote the equation, he thought the value for that, at least in our solar system, was somewhere between one and three. So we know of at least one habitable planet, because we're standing on it. And we also think that at some point, maybe Venus was habitable, maybe Mars was habitable. Something happened, those two went their own separate ways. But we're also learning that there are a lot of worlds in the solar system that are capable of hosting life as we know it that are not actually planets. And so this is an image of Enceladus, which is a moon that orbits Saturn. There's a global ocean tucked beneath its crust that's actually erupting through fissures in the moon's south pole. And it's literally putting a ring of salt water around Saturn. Based on observations, scientists think that Enceladus contains all the ingredients that are necessary for life as we know it to thrive there today. That's also true of Europa, a moon that orbits Jupiter, and Titan, another moon that orbits Saturn. And Thomas is going to tell you about those in a few minutes if I ever shut up. So if we consider that not only planets can host life, then I think you'll see that the value for n sub e also goes up. And at this point, we get to f sub l the fraction of worlds on which life evolves, and this is where we, act, we run out of data. We know of one, right? And so Thomas is gonna tell you next about how the bulk of NASA's science missions and programs are actually focused on figuring out this value. But before we go there, I wanted to pause briefly and just mention, or ask the question, when you're looking for life in the cosmos, or even in your own stellar backyard, what are you actually looking for? And the answer is biosignatures. And that's an easy answer to a question that is really neither simple nor easy. So in 2018, um, Naveau and colleagues published a paper in Astrobiology describing what they called a framework or a guide or a roadmap for folks designing missions to robotically search for life remotely. And they called this the ladder of life detection. And so the idea is that over here, you have a bunch of potential biosignatures, which are you know, characteristics or traits of life. And as you move up the ladder, they become more reliable um, indicators that life exists. And so on the bottom, you have things like um, biofabrics. Uh, they call <laughs> this category is suspicious biomaterials, which is suspicious sounding. Um, but here they're talking about things like microbial mats, dermatolites, um, structures that are could be fairly ambiguous. You get up to metabolic byproducts, and then finally, if you can manage to find an example of Darwinian evolution remotely, which would be very tricky, that would be a slam dunk indicator that you found life. The rest of the chart, as you move over to the right um, presents various issues that come up when you think about instrumentation and when you think about actually performing the experiment. And these are things that the authors included because of lessons learned from NASA's Viking spacecraft. So. Well, so you just gave that chart out of the paper, straight out of the paper. And what I did here is uh, I took the chart and made it a lot simpler. Uh, those. Is th those uh, factors on the left are now plotted across the board. And frankly, what I'm going to do is for a bunch of observations, I'm going to show you what the type of factors are we're going after in this again, starting from physical and chemical environments on the left all the way to Darwinian evolution. Now, I'll be honest, I added one part to it on the right because we're going to talk about it, which is techno signatures. Techno signatures, of course, from the beginning uh, were part of the research that 
that uh, Frank Drake proposed, and I added it there just because there is quite a lot of work that is happening there, and we're going to talk about that also. All the rest is straight out of the paper. So this is uh, really that ladder of life from physical, chemical environment, biofabrics, and so forth, molecules, uh, all the way to Darwinian evolution uh, going forward. Before I jump on that, I want to just remind everybody, and you mentioned uh, the mission already, uh, the Viking mission, uh, frankly, is one of the most astonishing missions ever in the history of NASA. If you just look at the number of uh, my language, uh, I'm talking to the chief technologist here of the agency, uh, the, uh, the way I talk about these are miracles, kind of you start the mission, you don't know how it's going to work. So it feels like a miracle to me every time, but you work through it and frankly every mission has one miracle. I, I don't want a NASA mission as a taxpayer or as an AA that has no miracles. A uh, simple reason for that is we want to advance, we move the ball down the field, we want to get better, we want to do things that we haven't done before, that's what NASA is about. Well, Viking, if you added up the miracles there, you know, you probably cannot, you get past the 10, all uh, fingers of your, bo both of your hands, because everything in terms of the instruments that were on there, together with the entry, descent, and landing, the orbit determination, we have a specialist in the room, uh, and many of the other things were entirely new. And I just, uh, just the same way as Frank Drake did, Drake did his first observations of uh, these two stellar systems, in many ways Viking is the first shot on goal for uh, really finding life, F sub L. Uh, and just like Frank Drake, it did, it did not work the first time because it turns out context really, really matters. Uh, but we cannot give this talk without talking about Viking because of the amazing just portfolio of technologies that we're still using to today and we've built on in the last uh, many years from uh, 75. Uh, these are the missions that are currently in a science mission portfolio, and uh, we're not going to talk about all of them, but uh, the reason I always show that chart uh, is, uh, you know, you look at uh, the pulse space missions, the ones that we're working on right now, that the agency is working on right now, getting ready for launch, like Roman, uh, or, uh, or uh, many of the other missions around the moon uh, this year. A lot of these things are going to turn into uh, normal funds, uh, because we have three launches going to the moon, at least. Uh, but then there's also missions that I'm going to talk about. The reason I always show this is because each one of those words stands for a team. It's not just a machine, it's a team of people who give their all to make these missions happen. I just want to acknowledge that whether it's this or a ground-based observatory, uh, it's teams that stand behind it and uh, we're speaking here like it's easy. Uh, let me just tell you, all of these missions are very, very hard and none of them are given. So. Uh, before I move into the analysis of uh, F sub L with, uh, these, uh, with this ladder of life context, let me just quickly tell you two reasons why we observe uh, life elsewhere. And uh, the first reason is it's the law. Uh, 2017, uh, the NASA Authorizing Act was passed, and many of these things were quite known, like why is NASA exist? Uh, the expansion of human knowledge on Earth and phenomena in the atmosphere and space was there before, for quite a while. So we could read all of those, and then you get to the 10th. And the 10th one says, the search of life's origin, evolution, distribution, and future in the universe. That really changed the discussion. For me, uh, as the associate administrator, uh, basically I started asking question, are we doing this across the board and how are we advancing that focus, not just on missions, but also how we do research and analysis. I'm going to show you that we actually opened up research programs for studies that previously we did not do so because the same Congress that asked us to do this many years ago told us to not do that. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence was not something we should be focused on. Here, uh, the Congress says, go do it. So that's number one reason. The number two reason is, is the priorities we're getting from the national academies. So one of the jobs that is not NASA's responsibility is to prioritize science against science. 
Uh, frankly, I don't know how to do that. Uh, I was so grateful for these documents because otherwise, you know, like these scientists are really quite convincing at times. And you don't want to be in a place that every week there's a different priority because the last scientist that came in on Friday convinced you of some mission. Uh, these missions, they take decades uh, in some of the most amazing complex cases or at least five years and some of the others. And so basically what we do, whether it's uh, uh, to your left, the, uh, whether it's uh, the planetary priorities or whether it's to your right, the astronomy and astrophysics priorities, these are the strategies for 10 years out, the next 10 years. Both of them tell us that searching for life elsewhere is the highest priority uh, facility kind of, uh, or kind of flagship mission uh, in, in, uh, uh, in many of the areas. Uh, uh, Mars sample return on one and uh, the Habitable Worlds Observatory on the other. And so, so basically that is the other reason we go uh, do this and, uh, and uh, move forward. Now before I, I jump into uh, the analysis, I want to just quickly tell you that there's enormous work that is being done at Earth that is really changing the way we're thinking about nature elsewhere. And that is, uh, we're learning about life in ways that we did not know. For example, life is tough. I remember sitting on a plane. I was in Michigan still, and I sat on a plane, I sat next to a guy, basically said, what do you do for a living? I'm a biologist, uh, what do you do? I find life in the permafrost, like there's no life in the permafrost, it's frozen, there's radioactive, radioactivity there, uh, especially in Siberia, uh, you know, uh, in, in, because of the geology that's there, and uh, that will kill all life. Oh no, there's life. And life has adapted in a way these bacteria that he's sticking out in a way that is there. Extremophiles are everywhere, it turns out. And it's absolutely stunning uh, that life is in the, the thermal vents in the oceans, in the darkness of caves. It's, it's life is everywhere in ways, frankly, we would have never guessed. Life is tenacious. Uh, there are things that happen on this planet that are really making it hard for life to survive. In some local areas, sometimes even globally, life doesn't. And when conditions get tough, uh, life moves inside the rocks. It doesn't just disappear, it moves inside the rocks. So if we look at other rocks, our mind always say, hey, we learned, we need to dig. <laughs> because uh, very often what's at the surface is not a good reflection of what's below it. And then it's metabolically diverse. It eats anything, it breathes anything. Sometimes it slows itself down to a way that it can survive even though it would have never survived if uh, you know, the speed of metabolism was the kind of bacteria or plants that are around you. So life is incredible and we've learned that on our own planet, the one planet where we're sure there is life. We're still working on intelligence sometimes. <laughs> so I uh, want to basically give you uh, now a discussion of F sub L on, on uh, really the ladders of life detection and the first, the first kind of uh, domain is really the one of exoplanets and I'm so glad I already started that discussion because so much occurred in 1995, I'll never forget it, in a conference in Rome. Uh, two, a uh, guy stood up and basically said, we found, by the way, they're Nobel Prize winners now, and, uh, that, but they stood up and said, we found these two planets, and with those two planets, all the models of planetary systems to this date that I have been learning were dead that day, which is by, in the evening, everybody said they're not good observations. It turns out, of course, that's not the case. They were good observations. You saw the, the beautiful uh, characteristics of these uh, stellar systems that are there. And I, when I came to NASA, the first press conference I read, ran was uh, one of those dwarfs, red dwarfs, the, uh, the TRAPPIST system. Uh, TRAPPIST was done by a Belgian group observed from the ground-based observatory and then Spitzer, which had run out of its coolant, was just staring onto this thing and, and basically I just happened to be in the right place and I uh, was in that press conference and announced that this star not only had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Planets, by the way, an eighth one was found later on, but three of them were in the so-called habitable zone, making it really important to look at for these, by the way, all of these planetary systems fit on the inside of Venus, uh, 
kind of in terms of geography, just because because overall the star is so much smaller and has less gravity, so the whole thing shrinks. But nonetheless, these systems are there. I did the press conference and I went home. At that point, I was expected to be fired because the president had switched. So I was not moving the family yet to uh, DC. And I lived in a little rented apartment at the museum that was still there. And there were all these newspaper articles out in the morning. I woke up the next morning and I walked along there and basically pretty much every single newspaper in the world and most newspapers in the United States had this above the fold, that picture, the artistic image. Because, see, when we talk about life elsewhere, it speaks to us in a way that it does, many of the science topics don't speak to us. And I, I was just feeling the importance of that result and the, really the imagination that was kicked uh, on uh, by this. This was only the beginning. Uh, what happens, of course, and uh, with this new telescope that, uh, that is out there uh, uh, a million miles uh, from the Earth, uh, kind of towards uh, the direction where the sun is at noon, uh, basically that's, uh, that's where it is, kind of at, at midnight, uh, kind of uh, in the middle of the night, uh, the opposite direction. Uh, that telescope is observing. Now, what does this picture have to do with exoplanets? Well, what are you looking here in the Carina Nebula, it remains one of my most favorite pictures because it's one of the first pictures I've seen from that, uh, from that telescope, arguably with wet eyes because I was so relieved. But uh, again, uh, uh, nature is so beautiful. What you see here uh, is in these kind of brownish, yellowish uh, um, colors is a whole generation of former stars that lost their, shed their outer uh, layers and gave it back to interstellar space. And what you see, all these dots in there forming new stars and with it planetary systems. You can go focus into some of these and you see the elongation that is so indicative of a rotational uh, place. So, so what we're learning from this uh, with uh, James Webb Space Telescope is that these kind of yellowish, brownish materials are not just atoms. Many of them are carbon molecules. So the building blocks that all this, these pieces are starting are a lot more chemically complex than I was told in class in the 90s. Because all this stuff was much, much later. Well, it's right there hanging out. And so for me, I want to uh, mention that. I'm going to get back to it. What's really exciting, though, and uh, Mark Clampen, by the way, developed, uh, who's sitting in the front row here, developed uh, some of these technologies first uh, with, uh, kind of imagined it, but then uh, did it with Hubble, and now with Webb, of course, is really uh, using uh, coronographs, kind of covering, if you want, a star to really see the dimmer the, the, the dimmer uh, exoplanets, and you see in various wavelength range uh, with various instruments on James Webb Space Telescope, you see these kind of fuzzy images of these exoplanets. By the way, you should know the James Webb Space Telescope was imagined, was, was invented before the first planets were there. So kind of the fact that the images look like this is a sheer miracle and talks about the amazing commitment of Mark and uh, of course the engineers that, that built the telescope so this could be done. What's also exciting though, we can't just do this image. We can actually, as the uh, exoplanet goes in front and behind the, the star, we can kind of subtract out uh, what is the stellar emission and basically see the emission of, uh, of uh, the atmosphere of such planets. So all of a sudden we have a tool set that allows us to see in this particular hot gas giant exoplanet. That's not a place you want to live for anybody. That's not the point here, but kind of the tool set basically tells you, hey, we can really detect the fingerprints of CO2 in that particular exoplanet unequivocally. That's the tool set we want to go after all these uh, things that, that are there in this ladder of life, these later uh, pieces that are there. And that's the tool set that is going to be uh, developed. Now I want to tell you what I lose sleep over even now that I'm no longer at NASA since I quit so I can go skiing uh, uh, at, after uh, the, the, at the end of the year, is a telescope that was proposed in that decadal strategy, the Habitable Worlds Observatory. It's a telescope that is built to find 
these atmospheric signatures in Earth-like planets. So I want to tell you, uh, to me, this is already being imagined. The best people that I know worldwide are already working on this. Uh, some of them are the ones that made uh, the James Webb sales, uh, Space Telescope happen right now. And keep your eye open for that. I'm sure there will be talks later on this stage and elsewhere about this, because that will really fundamentally change how we're looking at these uh, factors down the line because we, honest to God, have the tool set that is there. We'll already make a lot of progress, especially in these kind of Trappist One-like uh, systems that are from smaller stars. But this is the one uh, that I have my eye on. All right, the second chapter, and you mentioned that also because of your Enceladus story, is icy bodies. Uh, recall that uh, uh, this uh, kind of the recognition that there's uh, icy bodies out there that have are interesting really came with the Galileo mission after flying by Europa and recognizing that something is very wrong. It did not behave like it should, like, uh, like a rocky or kind of a solid uh, body should, kind of the dielectric said, well, wow, there's liquid water in there. How can that be? With that uh, whole field open and a world that makes us focused on it. Before I jump on these, I want to just link back to the Carina Nebula. Remember that beautiful with the yellow, brownish, uh, and so forth? So you look at it from the planetary side. Where are these complex molecules? Well, they're sitting in what we call the primitive bodies, these small bodies, whether it's comets, whether it's uh, asteroids that are there. And uh, frankly, uh, some of these bodies, they scare us because they make craters on Earth. And so uh, with the DART uh, mission, we moved one, bumped one a little bit to prove that we can bump it out of the way. But there's uh, many other missions that are there. One that's on my mind and you should uh, uh, keep your eye open for is uh, one that is going to uh, drop off precious freight in September, and it's uh, uh, OSIRIS-REx, uh, which is uh, uh, a sample return mission by NASA. And frankly, we picked up the sample on October 20, 2020, just so it's easy to remember, 10, 20, 2020. You'll never forget that, right? So, so we picked it up, and you remember October 2020 is before any of the vaccines. I remember uh, being in the room with masks, and uh, you know the team, uh, frankly, was there making that touch and go uh, that tag, uh, doing meeting each other for the first time all together in, uh, since the beginning of uh, COVID. So uh, it just uh, what happened there is they went down uh, left is before the Nightingale Crater before and after you see the surface was touched. Uh, frankly, uh, one of the big surprises was that the body was really not like a rock. It fell apart. So in other words, the, the arm that had this sample container went in almost two feet before the spacecraft said, something is wrong, we better back off. I'm remembering sitting there, it's like, wow, it's not turning around. Why is it not turning around? It was supposed to hit rock and then turn around. It never hit rock. It's just a ginormous dust bunny. <laughs> but, uh, but in there is also water or complex molecules of the type that occurred kind of early on uh, in the environment of Earth uh, that, that was there, and it's going to come back, and it's being dropped off uh, late September uh, this year. Back to Europa. Europa is in the most horrible place in the solar system. The radiation is way worse than near the sun because of Jupiter creating all this ionizing radiation, but it is an exciting body because it has ocean has, has water on the inside and a surface that is evolving on a time scale short compared to a decade. So as we observe it, this uh, surface uh, is uh, changing. We're really excited about Europa because it has all these ingredients we believe really are needed to build life, such as water, uh, because it moves molecules around. So they meet each other and build bigger molecules, uh, organics. Uh, because uh, at least in one case, we know organics are really quite useful for life, uh, energy, and the stability to really make that experiment go on for billions of years. And there's a mission that is currently being assembled, uh, the Europa Clipper mission, whose main science is to determine whether there are places below Europa's surface that could support life. And I want to tell you, I'm so excited about this mission. Uh, you can go online and just look for Clipper. Uh, this is how the picture looked two days ago. Uh, you know, the, the 
Teams are building it. Uh, all but two instruments are submitted, including the most complicated mass spec ever filled for this kind of application. And it actually making the mass range much larger because, uh, frankly, the one I'm going to talk about for Nadia's favorite planet called Mars, um, uh, she does not like Mars, but uh, she can talk about that later in the discussion. Uh, for Nadia's favorite planet, Mars, uh, that mass spec immediately was kind of, the range was fully utilized. The, the, comp, the molecules are way more complex than initially we imagined. This is Clipper, uh, ready to fly um, uh, in just a couple of years. So uh, the second uh, kind of world that we're really focused on is Titan. So it's really a prime target for astrobiology research because it's so different in many ways. It's uh, an analog to the early Earth, uh, we believe, to provide clues of how prebiotic chemistry under these conditions may have progressed. Think of Titan as a, as a moon with a thicker atmosphere than the Earth and basically a landscape that's an oil spill. So it's all of, of kind of carbon, you know, uh, molecules that are out hanging there. So because of the atmosphere that is so thick, we can actually use a very different methodology and we can fly with a radioactive, uh, radi radio I mean, nuclear powered um, uh, kind of spacecraft that has these rotors and that kind of analyze multiple places. Again, look at the chemical composition all the way to see whether there's actually li signatures of life. Uh, this is, I believe, the first mission since Viking where the, where the entire focus is actually on life detection. And the instruments are built for that. And that was so attractive uh, to me and our team and we uh, selected a mission going forward. So, so this is, by the way, probably the hardest mission besides uh, Mars sample return and uh, the habitable Earth Observatory for, in terms of technologies. But I'm sure the team at the Applied Physics Lab and all its partners can uh, figure it out. Finally, your favorite planet. Uh, Mars has been a location where we learned a lot about our environment. It's a location that I could show you an image of today, which is kind of this desert-like, uh, you know, Star Wars planet, but it's not. Uh, what I'm showing you is a picture, a sketch of a result that we believe uh, is indicative of uh, Mars, uh, frankly, in uh, three billion years ago, where a large fraction of the surface is covered by water. What's not shown here is certainly the atmospheric conditions, the clouds and, and so forth, which are surely there. We think the atmosphere was a lot stronger. We think there was a magnetic field there also. But how do we get to that? Uh, by the way, before we look at the history, uh, uh, the Chesero Crater, I'm going to go there later. That's where Perseverance is roaming right now as we speak tonight. Uh, would have looked uh, three billion years ago like this lake, uh, kind of a crater lake. You've seen things like that. You travel around. You've seen those. Well, the crater lake that is up there on Mars uh, was a pretty, had a really kind of a violent story because the water came in and out and was so strong that it pulled rocks out out in the, in the flatlands. I know that from Switzerland, but there's a lot bigger slopes there. So, so, so the point is, uh, the water was quite dramatic in, in its, uh, in its uh, ability to shape the surface. All right, so the steps that got us there, of course, started with spirit and opportunity. I remember watching online how they landed and, uh, you know, uh, white knuckling it. Uh, this time I did not have the speech uh, in my pocket that nobody wants to give, but you're hoping you can tear up afterwards. A spirit and opportunity landed in uh, 2004 within, uh, you know, 21 days of each other. 90-day mission, you know the story, up, you watch it on Prime if you haven't. Uh, just such an amazing, I can say that now, Mark. Go watch on Prime. <laughs> so, so, uh, so it's an amazing story about uh, really, again, a team coming together and doing science that is just uh, incredible. Again, the result was uh, dramatic, frankly, that long ago, Mars was a lot wetter and conditions on Mars could have sustained microbial life, but not everywhere is the same. Uh, where spirit was, was just a terrible place to build life, uh, we believe, based on the pH value and so forth. But incredible uh, insights. Curiosity followed up. 
Uh, and it's just 10 years last year that it's been on the surface of Mars with much more sophisticated instruments, uh, analyzed minerals, and frankly, the mass spectrometer built uh, right here uh, at Goddard uh, really, I think, was the most dramatic in terms of the, the uh, insights that came from it. Uh, some of these insights I'm going to uh, tell you about uh, relate to molecules that were of high complexity, handedness of molecules that were different, left and right handed. By by the way, the way on Earth uh, we would look for biotic uh, type of life generated kind of molecules. Uh, by the way, we are not saying it's there, we're just saying the indications are there and we need to really understand what creates it. Methane emissions, again, another one of those uh, indications. Curious, curiosity is great. For me, uh, my favorite picture is really this one, a Gale Crater. Uh, you know, uh, with the mountains in the background, uh, this is, used to be a, a lake. Now you know it, you see, right? You've been to places like this. I always uh, argue that the difference is usually if you go to places back there, there are campers with people with really long hair uh, that, uh, that, uh, that I've been at. But, uh, you know, see the, the front is, uh, you know, it, it, there was water over these rocks. And, uh, and that's, in fact, what the, the team has proven that that in fact was the case. So Mars is an exciting place, remains an exciting place because of the fact that the next step that is occurring is really not only analyzing things in situ and sending bits back, but actually sending the samples back. Uh, we do not believe that at the surface of Mars there's life. Uh, we could be wrong. Uh, I always said I, I, I take a bet and I lick the first sample. <laughs> it, it's, it's the no-lose solution. If it kills me, I'm famous. <laughs> Forever. If it doesn't kill me, it, I, we save a lot of money <laughs> because we don't have to, you know, protect so badly. Anyway, so so the uh, we it's an international effort that uh, will bring this uh, these samples back. The samples have been generated, and I want to tell you, just two weeks ago, we deposited the cache on the surface of of Mars. So there's a dozen samples on the surface of Mars ready to be returned. By the way, we want to return the ones on the rover but we put them on the surface just in case something happens to the rover. We're never 100% sure this way we get our money's worth, we can go there and get the samples back. So this is happening as we speak. These samples are some of them from volcanic origin and some of them sedimentary. And we believe in there, and I do bet my car on it, it's not as nice as yours, no. uh, but, uh, but I do bet my uh, little Ford on it that, uh, that uh, you know, there will be uh, you know, uh, signs of, uh, you know, extinct life possibly in there, or at least uh, important constraints that basically says why it couldn't have happened. This is the next step, and of course we're working on it right now. Perseverance is already there. A lander will a land up there. It will take off in 27, 28, and uh, land and with uh, the first launch vehicle uh, off the surface of Mars, and then bring it back to a European orbiter that's waiting in orbit. Uh, will dock to it and then uh, bring it back to Earth and drop it off uh, in Utah. So uh, I'm going to have my house in Utah, so I'm waiting for it. Uh, early 30s, that's what will happen. You get my point. F sub L is the place where we're investing and the way NASA is doing it, motivated by the academies, is we're going all in. Every world that we know how, and uh, of course with the agreement of all the stakeholders uh, on Congress, NASA and so forth, uh, we're going to find, really look at that interface of the chemical and physical world. So Nadia, why don't you take us forward? Before I move forward, I just want to make the point that Thomas said spirit was in the worst place ever to find life. Where was spirit again? On Mars. <laughs> okay. So, um, we obviously don't know at this point how common life is, and we don't know how commonly ecosystems might evolve creatures who are capable of crafting detectable technologies, which are the next two variables in the equation. Um, but I think SETI pioneer Jill Tarter made my point that I'm about to make much more eloquently when she said that what we've learned about our environment in an astronomical sense is just making SETI an inevitable question. You're forced by the science that has come over the past decades to take that next step. 
And so when we think about what we're learning about the amount of habitable cosmic real estate that's out there, when we're learning about the fact that we have life's building blocks kind of splattered all over these bodies in the solar system, okay, maybe that was a little too dramatically phrased, but they're common. Um, it's not that much of a leap between thinking about habitability and thinking about technology. They're kind of one and the same. And so um, Jill actually in 2017, she coined the term technosignatures to describe the range of technologies that SETI scientists are looking for. And as this relates to the variable F sub C, which is originally described as the fraction of civilizations that develop communicative technologies, I think right now we can all agree that should probably be a little bit more broadly defined because SETI searches are no longer limited to looking for technologies that evolved specifically for the purposes of communicating. So yes, searches are still looking for things like radio waves, which is what dad had envisioned in 1960 because that's what we used. But SETI scientists are also looking for things like pulses of optical light. They're looking for waste heat generated by energy harvesting megastructures. They're looking possibly for extraterrestrial artifacts in our own solar system. And they're looking, they're using algorithms, actually they're, des they're designing algorithms to go through astronomical data sets and just look for things that are weird and remove some of the baked in assumptions that we have about what detectable technologies should look like. So there's actually a huge range of searches that are being done in the technosignature field right now. And I think what that suggests, that diversity suggests, is that technosignatures are, as we made the argument in our abstract, tiptoeing in from the fringe and starting to go more mainstream. And another reason why I think we can make that argument is this project. Well, it's called Breakthrough Listen. And this is the most ambitious SETI search launched to date. It kicked off in 2015. It's a $100 million 10-year search for radio techno signatures around the nearest million or so stars. It leans very heavily on this telescope, the Green Bank Telescope, also known as the Great Big Telescope because it is very, very big, at the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia, which is a nice little kind of connecting, oops, um, closing that loop. And actually the GBT is about a mile down the road from the Tatel Telescope where dad's first Osmo search kicked off in 1960. So um, Breakthrough Listen recently published a paper. Even within the radio technosignature community, they're starting to think about different ways that those technosignatures could present themselves. So they published a paper very recently looking at results from a survey of about 1,800 stars where instead of just looking for a continual transmission, they were actually looking for pulses of radio waves, which I think is a creative way to go about doing this. You saw that publication from the Breakthrough List, and this is another one. Uh, so the, the first one that you just talked about, of course, was funded by a foundation, a private foundation, the Breakthrough Foundation. This one is funded by NASA, and it's uh, really uh, an analysis uh, that came out in Astrophysical Journal on uh, nitrogen dioxide pollution as a, as a structure of extraterrestrial, uh, as a signature of extraterrestrial technology. Uh, those analyses, uh, which of course would work if you looked at the Earth uh, in some of the cases, are really sophisticated analysis with a huge uh, potential, uh, as is the one that made news this week. Uh, this week in Nature, uh, astronomy, a uh, paper came out on uh, a deep learning search for techno signatures from 820 nearby stars by Ma et al. It made news because, of course, it returned eight promising extraterrestrial uh, intelligence signals of interest not previously identified. The technologies deployed here uh, were uh, very much different, kind of really at advancing the searches and the depth of the searches using AI, uh, machine learning type of work that some of you do for a living. And uh, re-observations of these targets uh, have not resulted in uh, re-detections of signals with similar morphology. Uh, so either these signals are changing over time or, uh, you know, like require, of course, follow-up. The point is, this work is really going forward. Now, if you had any doubts about this, you should have been in Seattle at the last uh, annual uh, meeting of the uh, American Astronomical uh, Society. And uh, basically in that meeting, second to last bullet, uh, they, were, uh, they had oral sessions in that 
thousand uh, abstract or more on this particular topic. I want to point out why that is. Because of that law that passed in 2017, we changed the rules at NASA. So actually, techno-signature research is can be supported, and so that is an allowed topic. Of course, the standard remains high. We don't want to waste money ta of taxpayers, but there's, a, as a result of that, frankly, in the broad interest that you hear the enthusiasm from in, in this talk, there's multiple academic programs in, in the US, uh, for example, at UC Berkeley, at Penn State, UCLA, UCSD, and others that are educating PhD students and undergrads and everything in between uh, that are focused on this. Uh, so, so the kind of vision that your dad had, you know, in 1960 uh, about these other terms that were a lot less popular in the meantime really are starting to take off. And, uh, and I'm really proud kind of, uh, that so much of it he actually did see uh, before, uh, before, of course, he passed away last year. So, so there are funding sources that are diverse. That's, that's what good research does. Yes, government, there should be foundations, companies as well. That's, that's what we like. And so, uh, you know, if we're talking about this, uh, what are the kind of things we would not do? And uh, of course, uh, there's very really little. Because we believe that science, and I mean that, is really the most useful tool set that we have available to address questions that are plaguing us or creating answers to questions that are on our minds. And that also uh, is in the context of unidentified anomalous phenomena. And uh, when I was at NASA, I, I basically, of course, talking with the administrator, uh, you know, I look at these pictures and I, you know, I talk to uh, people like this. Uh, the most important problem with this research area is that, uh, that the picture is what we know. There's very little data, in other words. And so what, we're, what, we, what I tasked a, a team to do is uh, to really look at the 24 or so spacecraft that are looking at the Earth, at the various telescopes that are looking the other way, and really ask, how do we use these novel technologies and analyze and make this a much more data-rich field? Now, you're part of that. What is happening there? I'm going to toss that question to Matt in the audience, who's also on our team. Um, Work is ongoing. We have decided as a panel that we will not comment publicly on what's happening until we release the report later this spring. So the, the point I'm trying to make, and we wanted to, the, the reason I wanted to talk about it here, I think it's really important, and I, I'm talking kind of to the scientists in the room, that we do not shy back. Uh, from science solutions to uh, questions that are of broad interest. And uh, I mean, there's many questions that will have much more impact in the near future on our, on our lives uh, than this, but I don't understand why we should back off from this. And, and I'm uh, really excited uh, to see what's going on. But take us home, what is the last factor here? Okay. So if you want to solve the Drake equation, unfortunately, you also need a value for L, which is defined as the average length that a civilization is detectable for. And again, that's a very specific definition. And this factor, Dad put it in there, but it bothered him because he said it's the least knowable of all of the factors in the Drake equation. He actually called it vexed at one point, which is a description that has stuck with me. And there are multiple reasons for why that is, but let me just describe one of them. The answer to L depends not only on who's out there, but on who's asking the question, and on what kinds of technologies you have available to use to detect extraterrestrial civilizations. So if you think about Earth, for a civilization with technologies like ours, we've been detectable for somewhere on the order of a century, right, since military radar started squawking at the beginning of the 1900s, up until about now. But if you're a civilization that's much more advanced and you have much more powerful detection capabilities, then as Thomas told you, there's technosignature work going on looking at atmospheric gases as being an indicator of technological development. So if you had more powerful tools and you were observing Earth's atmosphere in the 1800s, you might have seen a shift that accompanied the Industrial Revolution. And if you continued to observe our atmosphere, you might continue to see that shift in atmospheric gases and potentially correctly interpret that as a technosignature. 
So for that civilization, Earth would be detectable for much longer than just a century so far. And that's part of why L is such a conundrum. Well, uh, Nadia, um, you know, as we kind of uh, get kind of uh, soon to the q and A, Ellery is already moving up. I just uh, want to uh, bring us back. This is a picture that is uh, made a lot of. Uh, uh, you know, made history because it's taken from the Orion uh, spacecraft uh, uh, as it's uh, kind of uh, flying towards the moon. And uh, it's, of course, looking at our home planet uh, from afar. Uh, this entire field, of course, as I told you, started here with our understanding of life. But it also, uh, of course, uh, relates to the longevity of this planet and uh, kind of the importance uh, of what there is uh, on this planet. Everybody, our entire history, everybody we love, our future uh, is on this planet. And so I just uh, want to make sure that, uh, that as I show this uh, kind of, mo you know, this amazing planet from afar that we remember that uh, this is an exciting field, uh, one that has really taken off, and uh, frankly, in a way that uh, not uh, any of us would have predicted. So, if, if you don't mind, if I just can ask you a couple questions up front. So, so if you write the the Drake equation down, there's a number. So, uh, uh, what is the number? <laughs> the solution to the Drake equation. Well. So I, I enjoyed asking Dad this question quite a lot. And the last time I asked it, he said, you know, the answer depends on what day you ask me. <laughs> and then he gave me his favorite answer, which he says is roughly 10,000. Well, somewhere between one and a billion. <laughs> Does that uh, help? And, and there are papers out there that, of course, uh, <laughs> have backed up some of these data. But kind of the, there's there's uh, some rare papers, and I just want to acknowledge them. That basically said there may be only a handful, right? Sure. Kind of, yep. uh, and and it really relates to some of these later uh, numbers a lot more. Kind of if if anything happened, kind of the the numbers at the front, the first four, all turn out to be much higher than we ever thought. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of the, I don't know what the likelihood is of, of life in the universe, but what I can tell you in my, during my career, my PhD is in 96, yes, I'm that old. In my career, uh, that number went up uh, between a factor of 10 to 100, depending on how you uh, count. So, so the number is up because of that, uh, and so that's exciting. So you're taking off to Italy. Uh, you're taking off to Italy uh, tomorrow. How does that relate to the talk? <laughs> I'll answer that question in a second, but I wanted to comment on something you Please. just said about estimates for how to solve the Drake equation. And you know, if, you, if you're optimistic, you think, well, maybe it is a billion, but it all kind of depends, as you said, those variables on the left are higher than we think they might be, but there's still a very good possibility that there's a bottleneck on the right. And so it kind of depends on where that ends up being, because right now we do know that we've searched quite a bit and we haven't found anything. Um, so. I just wanted to make that comment. Um, I am going to Italy tomorrow, and I'm going caving, and we are going to go look for incredibly interesting life forms that live in these caves in an environment where they really kind of shouldn't be there. And so this relates to the slide that you had up about looking for life on Earth, what we can learn about life's tenacity just by observing our own planet, and from there extrapolate to environments that it could inhabit elsewhere in the cosmos. And so deep in these caves, in chambers where the water is anoxic and the air is toxic, microbes have somehow found a way to make a living. And not only that, to assemble themselves into these large tentacle-shaped structures, which scientists have analyzed and they have figured out that based on the amount of energy that's available in the cave, which seems to be very small, the cells multiply or divide once every century, maybe, once every millennium. Um, so it's a way of making a living that I think speaks very well to the tenacity of life, but also could be a very cool analog for some of the very first life that evolved on Earth, which of course, we're talking about astrobiology in the context of looking for life beyond Earth, but astrobiology also includes a search for life's origins here. Can I ask you a question now? Yeah, uh, go for it. Okay. <laughs> So we've been talking about looking for life beyond Earth, but and you mentioned how you became interested in that, um, looking up at the stars in Switzerland, but what would it mean to you if we actually found an example of life beyond Earth? 
Well, uh, for me, it will be a profound change in how we not only look at nature, but look at ourselves. Fundamental different change, right? The question really, even if it's microbial life elsewhere, a different genesis, uh, so to say, of uh, microbial life would change everything. I mean, for me, it, it kind of, uh, see, the reason I studied physics, Nadia, I don't know I don't ever told you that story, is uh, not because of physics. I was in a class, I grew up uh, strictly Mennonite. I was in a class and I had the, class, uh, the physics teacher gave a class, a lecture on the Copernican Revolution. And I, what, what amazed me is that you could study nature and change the trajectory of humanity with that. The recognition that the Earth is not in the center of the universe undercut a lot of the sayings of people in power on the religious side especially, but also the other side. And I felt that if that could occur, that studying nature is not only about knowing, but also about how we think about ourselves. That is worth doing. Uh, there's other transitions that occurred that way, but this one will be certainly at the same level because I really believe it's there. It, it will, it's it very hard to predict, right? I've talked to uh, very, very uh, religious people, uh, in, uh, many of them in my family, that uh, would recheck that that will occur. I've also talked to others that basically said that is very much predictable, that uh, the Lord could create multiple of those areas. So, so I don't know how that world would react. Uh, it's hard to predict. But it is a, an amazing leap, I think, really connecting these physical and chemical understandings of the world to a biological one of, you know, an add to life, which we have just one, all life here is related, another one, and really learn about the fundamentals thereof. Do you think your response or um, the responses of the people you were speaking about would be different based on the type of life that we found? So would you respond differently to a discovery of microbial life versus um, a biosignature in an exoplanet atmosphere or, you know, the, a technosignature? detection doesn't matter. Well, I mean, I think kind of the questions I'm getting asked, right, kind of what I was getting asked especially, uh, even now with, you know, if you, if you put a UAP committee together, the good news is your Twitter followers number goes up really quickly. I'm not sure that's good news. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, but so uh, the questions I'm being asked, right, it really is clear that the techno signature would be uh, quite scary for some people. I mean, uh, many people... Uh, you know, uh, even though they're without kind of saying that that would be uh, a bad, an indication of something bad, uh, many people are quite fearful. I think the bacterial version, even though, uh, you know, as you know, uh, uh, bacteria are not good for our health possibly also, kind of the techno sectors that I think would be harder to, uh, to deal with. Uh, but, but frankly, a lot of this is pure conjecture, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm just listening to what people are worried about and what they're talking to us uh, about. And so that's what, what it's based on. What do you think? I think it would be a different response. I think it's interesting that you said that techno signatures are scary. Um, in one sense, I can understand that if it is something like a UAP that is very close to Earth, but in general, I think we tend to think of technosignatures as originating from very, very, very far away, and so I don't know where the threat is in that. Um, I think to me, what's actually the scarier outcome is if we are it, is if there's nothing else out there. To me, that's, that's a more interesting result, and of course, it's very hard to prove a negative, and so I don't know if we'll ever get there. Um, but I think that's that's the more interesting and potentially the more kind of frightening answer. But I don't know why it's frightening. It's weird. Maybe I like to think about looking for life beyond Earth as you know, kind of a planet-wide quest to avoid isolation, which we all learned that we hate during the pandemic. Humans don't like being alone, and maybe that's true on a planetary scale. But I, I don't know. That's that's my musing. Well, Larry, I think. Uh uh, we're going to uh, turn it over to uh, Q&A. Uh, Nadia, thanks for uh, sharing the stage with me, and uh, thanks for uh, telling the story of your family and uh, the story of the research that you're uh, reporting on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you.
So we have time for some questions. Please stand up, tell us your name, and tell us if you're a member or not a member, and ask a question. I want to make a comment, though. I agree with you. The really, really strange result will be we're the only place that there's life. And what that would do to our whole conception of how physics, and chemistry, and biology work, uh, I think that would be pretty profound. Blue microphone. Frederica Dariman, I'm PRSW member. Thank you very much for your presentations. A lot of uh, food for thought. And so one question I have is regarding techno signatures. How can we distinguish whether they are what we consider generated kind of by human technology or technology versus physics, which we do not uh, happen in this planet, we have not discovered, we don't know about? That's a really, really good question. And I think the answers are multiple depending on the type of techno signature that you're actually looking for. Um, one of the questions that SETI scientists are asking is exactly that. How do you distinguish something that's artificial versus some kind of physics that you're not aware of or that you don't know to look for? Um, and I would say that, that uh, the field that's most mature there is actually the radio techno signature search because it's been ongoing for the most amount of time. Um, if you want more details, the person you want to talk to about that is Scott Ransom, who is, <laughs> sorry, I, we told you we were going to call on people in the audience to help out here. Um, Scott's a radio astronomer who has worked with SETI before, and he can he can tell you all the differences between um, naturally occurring radio pulses versus the kinds of signals that SETI is looking for. And a lot has to do with the statistic, the statistical distribution of things, and and, and uh, you know how uh, the pieces go together. Now, when we looked at the sun, there were really big surprises, right? Because the, there are areas of the sun that are uh, like a natural laser. It's a maser, right? That, that had a very different distribution. So, so even though you look at the, the statistical analysis that I showed the paper of, if you read that paper, you know, it, it, the, the arguments are really fully uh, based on uh, kind of a statistical test of, of the overall analysis and basically in what way uh, do certain signals kind of go uh, so and so many sigma on the other side of the distribution. That, that is certainly where you start. Uh, at the, the analysis does not stop there. You have to uh, prove you'd like to, you know, the movie contact, you'd like to see the prime numbers <laughs> coming back or something like that. <laughs> but uh, yeah. but in the absence of that, uh, more research is needed. I have a follow-up question, if I may. Uh, and uh, if we kind of detect something that we think is an interesting signal, uh, and this has come from millions of light years, <laughs> and that civilization doesn't exist anymore, what does this tell us? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's a non-zero chance that something like that can occur. I mean, I like somebody asked me. Uh, recently, if you found an alien that walk in the room, you know, for the first time and basically say, I'm here, it's like, uh, what's the first question you ask him? And uh, my first question is, how did you do it? <laughs> survive. <laughs> how did you survive? I, I really believe that, I mean, I, joking aside, I really believe there is an important uh, discussion there. That number L, uh, in your equation there, you know, the equation with your name on it is, is really has many different interpretations and one of them is the one that we talk about. How do you make sure that as a kind of global uh, society you, you survive? And, and I think, you know, I mean, once we know how to look for these things, once we listen enough, uh, you know, if, you know, assume that the world is not, we're the only ones. Uh, you know, I think that there's a non-zero likelihood that, that some of these things we observe are no longer there. The red microphone, Kirby. Yeah, good evening. I'm, I'm Kirby Runyon. I, I am a member of the PSW, uh, and I'm also a staff scientist at the Planetary Science Institute. Um, and my question is for both of you. Uh, in, the, in the National Academy's uh, Decadal Survey for Planetary Science, um, 
one of the really exciting mission concepts, of course, was the Enceladus Orbiter Lander, or Orbi Lander. Uh, Enceladus is spewing its guts into space, and it's the most slam dunk place to look for biosignatures outside of Earth and our own solar system. And the National Academies had an opportunity to tell NASA that that should be the number one uh, large strategic mission or flagship mission to pursue, and they didn't. They said that instead, presumably lifeless Uranus and its moons is the number one priority. And Thomas, you don't work for NASA anymore, so you can say whatever you want. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, in, in, in both of your opinions, and, and, and feel free to disagree with each other, of course, did the National Academies miss an opportunity to really advance astrobiology in this decade? So I want to just tell you, I won my bet. I predicted what, what happened. Let me tell you why I won. Uh, basically, uh, if you want to go to the uh, giant planets out there, uh, Neptune and Uranus, you need to do it in the next so and so many years. Because otherwise Jupiter moves, I mean frankly in the next decade or so, otherwise Jupiter moves away and you need a lot more propulsion to make it out there. So if you're sitting in these committees, kind of the, 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 the argument usually wins that said it needs to happen first, otherwise something bad happens. Enceladus did not have that uh, for itself. So just because of the psychology in the room, I predicted it would be a giant planet. And I mean, I, I won a dinner against the JPL director. <laughs> and because I said at the end, there, it's, see, I could, make, I could give a talk here and talk about the importance of the giant planets in the context of the astrophysical observations of all these other planetary systems and how little we know about it and uh, about that part of the solar system. I think Uranus is a very exciting, uh, very exciting place to go as is Neptune uh, with its environment and, and kind of the, the history. Remember, the movements out there shaped the entire uh, solar system, the trajectory of the entire history of the solar system. I think it's absolutely important to go do that. So there's, a, there's an other science narrative that's there. If Enceladus had that, you must go now, otherwise you cannot go for a long time, it would have won, but it did not have that for itself. Uh, I don't know whether you would have answered it differently. I'm still trying to think of how I would answer that question. <laughs> I think, though, the Decadal did prioritize an Enceladus mission. It was number four, right? So the Enceladus Life Finder smaller class mission is still on the docket. It's just not the Orbital Lander, Orbi Lander, which is a cool portmanteau. Um, so it's still in the portfolio, it's, but it's not the same. I, so I'm not sure how I would answer that. So if I had a lot of money, a foundation, and I wanted to uh, have an impact, that's something I would focus on. Because I actually think it's a lot easier to do than Uranus, because uh, it's, it's easier to get to. And you know, uh, I, th I think it's very easy to make huge history there, right? I just really, because because as you said, it's booing right out there. I remember when it was discovered, I, the guy who did the mass spec ran across the hallway. It's like, you can't believe what I'm finding. And I'm like, I looked at the data and it's like, did you clean your mass spec? You know, it's like all these alcohols <laughs> oh, and water. Yeah, and it's like, an I mean, that cannot be natural. Amazing. And of course it is. Uh, Colin Alberts, and I am a member. Um, I've got, I came here with a question, but I want to just sort of modify it a bit. And it does have to do with techno signatures. Um, I don't want to talk about UAPs because I don't want to talk about UAPs. Um, well, you're always and, supposed to ask a question. Well, okay. <laughs> at any rate, um, apart from, you know, a couple of years ago, we did have Avi Loeb uh, from uh, Harvard speak to us. And I don't necessarily want to discuss his theory either, but. Thank you. In general, <laughs> in general, do we want, is it worthwhile, is the juice worth the squeeze of looking for technical, techno signatures that are in our stellar neighborhood? Or is that something that's just a little bit too, um, you know, high gain, but, you know, too much investment given finite resources? Um, there is a small community of scientists who would say the answer to that question is absolutely yes. And one of the reasons is that looking for extraterrestrial artifacts in the solar system costs basically no extra money. Um, you can use the existing instruments and the missions that are being planned to do exactly that with like nothing else tacked on. And so why wouldn't you? Um, what's the harm? You know, what's the harm in keeping an eye out for something that might be kind of weird? You, you could learn a lot from that observation. So Mark, uh, when I 
prepared this talk. I thought about the amazing opportunity Roman will have to see these occultations of solar system objects uh, and, and uh, look at what that is. Uh, see, the way I always thought about techno signatures, fundamentally it's a different way of looking at nature. Uh, oh, it's almost, I cannot imagine a scenario in which it's a bad investment. Because generally speaking, what happens if you look at nature in a very different way, you get surprised. I mean, that's what happens with James Webb Space Telescope. But, but I could give you like many of those analysis things. Like when we argued at headquarters, you know, like, should we open it up? It's like, it's, it brings AI, it brings ML into, into these kind of analysis, uh, kind of analysis methodologies. And frankly, you're working on it, Scott, now. There's others who are doing amazing work, kind of doing accelerating models for galactic evolution based on kind of learning uh, kind of uh, algorithms. And some of these things have been developed elsewhere using these technologies. So for me, for me, uh, I think that it's worth, uh, you know, uh, looking, especially if the if the cost is not too big. I just really, just like Nadi, I really do believe that there's uh, amazing opportunities from telescopes that are uh, launched uh, within this decade, right? Uh, Roman will, will be dramatic, you know, 200, 200 uh, times the field of view, or kind of the speed of Hubble, uh, you know, in uh, visible and IR. I mean, it's, it's absolutely incredible what will come from that. I think we're going to the red microphone, and then we'll go to the blue microphone, and then I will take one from the web. Hi, my name is Alon Lanier. I'm uh, not a member. I just have a question about technologies that we have now with the James Webb, James Webb Telescope. It has. Uh, I'm interested in its infrared camera and its coronagraph. Are those both capable of measuring now Earth-sized planets? And if the answer is no, do you anticipate us having soon coronagraphs that are able to measure Earth-sized planets? Are we close to that point? So the way the uh, this telescope was designed is uh, really not optimized for Earth-sized planets near sun, kind of sun-type stars, solar-type stars. But see that Habitable Worlds Observatory that I talked about that uh, Mark, uh, you know, at the Astrophysics uh, Division is starting right now working on it. That is what we're going to do. So it's so it's it's actually way harder. Kind of what, what you need to do is the accuracy of holding the mirrors, the entire optics in place needs to be uh, more accurate by a factor of ten or hundred, depending on which uh, factor you look at. But the technologies are basically being developed uh, right now. So if everything, if Congress, everybody wants to have this happen, kind of between 15 and 20 years from now, we have that telescope up there. The blue microphone. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, Timothy Thomas, I am a member. I'm wondering if um, in the next few centuries, we explore all the bodies in our solar system very carefully for life the Enceladus, Titan, do them all. What would you be surprised if we came back with no evidence whatsoever except on Earth of life? Would I be surprised if we found absolutely nothing? I would. I You'd would. Be surprised. Yeah, I would be surprised. Although, you know, right now it's if you if you ask a lot of astrobiologists, do you think we're going to find signs of life beyond Earth? They'll say, I don't know. We don't have enough data right now to truly answer that question. So I think my sense of surprise comes from I'm not normally an optimist, but I think I am here. <laughs> like I really want life to be there and I think what as we've said what we're finding out about the abundance of building blocks and the abundance of habitable environments and just how stubborn life is about showing up even in places where you don't think it should be, um, my optimistic interpretation of that is I think there is life elsewhere in our solar system and I, and I would be surprised if we didn't yeah. find it. I too would, would be surprised and, and for me, look, as a scientist, the answer I don't know is a perfectly good answer and a correct answer. None of us knows. But we can figure it out. Right? I think the point I'm, we were trying to make here is we will learn a lot. Not, take these missions, even if we may not find life in the next uh, five, ten years based on all these missions. 
we will have boxed in life into a different box than kind of that the solutions in a different box than it is right now. My sense is the reason I was always so enthusiastic about this is frankly, I mean, it did start to me in 1995 when the first planets were found, actually discovered elsewhere. And then how each one, you know, water was found on, on the moon, on Mars. Uh, actually demonstrated with, uh, you know, epithermal neutrons kind of uh, from, uh, was, was demonstrated for the first time and all these cards started falling. All these things were assumptions and the, the, the proofs were there and in all, basically all cases that I knew of, the likelihood in any one of those factors was above what I was told. And so for me, see, what I would struggle with, right, kind of, what we've learned over time, starting with the Copernican revolution, what we, what we learned over time is we're not really in a special place or we're not that special in the universe, in a macroscopic sense. We're just in, in a galaxy of, of 100 billion or more <laughs> galaxies. We're in on them. We, we put, I mean, the most amazing thing is I still, it, just, it takes my breath away. Take the James Webb Space Telescope, look anywhere. And there are all these galaxies. And remember, the galaxies other than our own, the second one was found around 1900. Right? So, so for me, that kind, of, that kind of abundance of, yeah, we are not in a special place. Why should life be special? Right? You know, for me, it would like kind of the, the trend that we've learned in the last 100, 200 years would markedly take a turn. In a, in a direction that it never did in the, in the kind of during this time of science. Now that can happen. That's why I'm saying the answer is still I don't know, but uh, but I, it would really puzzle me because there is no, no indication of that anywhere relative to uh, just the trends uh, that we observed. Audio. Yeah, I just wanted to make two small comments. One is a teeny tiny shout out to pulsar planets, which were found in 1992. Um, and, <laughs> go pulsars. Um, and the second is what you were saying about if we actually don't find life elsewhere in the solar system, that is kind of shrinking the parameter space in which we can find it and helping us to redefine our conceptions of where it can exist. I would say that's exactly what happened on Mars in our history of looking for life on Mars. And we're still looking for it. It's just that now we don't expect to find anything that's currently alive on the surface, maybe on, in the subsurface, but right now we're spending billions of dollars looking for Martian fossils, which is definitely a shift from what we thought a century ago about possibilities for an inhabited Mars. And we have a question from YouTube. Ann? We do. We have two questions from YouTube. The first question is from Stu Sweet, who used to be a member. The question is, how has the field changed since the interstellar Oumuamua object whizzed through our solar system in 2017? Uh, it's an exciting object. Of course, there's a second one that has been uh, demonstrated, that had been talked about in, in uh, the literature, and it's basically a uh, uh, if you want a celestial body, if you look at the speed, it looks like it was swept up by the sun. So it was hanging out in interstellar space before the sun came around and plowed through the galaxy. So that's the speed that it will swing by the sun and disappear. So it's a, truly an interstellar uh, object. The fact that these interstellar objects uh, exist, uh, we always thought. It's like the first planet, perhaps not as dramatic in its, uh, in its uh, 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 interpretation. The fact that they exist, that there are pieces out there of celestial bodies that break up uh, is, absolutely, uh, is absolutely expected. Uh, uh, and I think we need to learn how to find them. Uh, I, I'm, kind of my, I'm actually kind of surprised that we don't have more than two. I actually predicted more. Because once you know and that, that you can look for those and you know how to, to find them, uh, it's, uh, it's easier. Now, how has the field changed? Uh, uh, you, you really kind of uh, Dr. Loeb from uh, Harvard uh, wrote, it was pretty adamant that this was really an indication of kind of a piece of a spaceship that was uh, breaking off. And he makes uh, the point uh, both in a publication and also in a book that got a lot of play. I would say if you took uh, at the American Astronomical Society and did a vote, uh, probably, uh, you know, say whoever stands with Avi over there and uh, the rest over there, I don't think the majority would be by Avi. That does not the, the way to decide whether something is correct or not. 
by the way, that is not the right way to decide. So while we may still be right, I just we would want to have uh, more uh, discussions about it. Certainly, open up. Uh, the field of really looking for extraterrestrial uh, uh, kind of extrasolar system bodies and uh, really uh, analyzing both the statistics and then kind of really figuring out what we can do. In fact, the European uh, Space Agency uh, wants to use a spacecraft that kind of park it uh, near Earth orbit and then go after one of them when it comes around the next time. We, of course, with the James Webb Space Telescope are ready uh, to actually uh, look at it and actually add a lot of data when the next uh, such object comes, uh, which surely is a matter of when, not if. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's enriching the field of science that's already there. Again, there's this uh, side note. Uh, I, I don't know how much emphasis to give it. Frankly, I'm not a specialist in it. Uh, I, uh, uh, I just, uh, my sense is, based on the papers I've looked at, it's certainly a controversy. How would you have answered? I would have answered a lot less eloquently than that. <laughs> that was a nice, nice answer. You think Avi did that just to be an agent or provocateur of a sort? It could, could be, and I, I think we need those too. I, I think, I actually think it's important that we have people who are willing to speak about things that are not in a, in a common kind of uh, agreed upon domain. Uh, I, just, I just really hope that all of us in the science community are willing to learn and reject our ideas. I mean, I mean, otherwise it's not science anymore. Uh, by the way, I'm not talking about Avi, I'm talking about myself and everybody else oh, the same way. The choir, but yeah. I'm perfectly fine if people have crazy ideas. I think we need those. And we should be okay with that. Uh, another question from the web. Yep, we have one more question from the web for Nadia. This is from Eric. Um, would you trade your next trip to the Amazon for a trip to Mars instead? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, okay, my next trip to the, no, <laughs> no, if you ask me if I would trade my next trip to the Amazon for a trip to low Earth orbit or to the moon, yes, Mars, I have no desire to visit, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not even if it's a round trip? <laughs> Not even if it's a round trip. <laughs> okay, I think the... Red microphone there, our physicist. My name's Scott Matthews, I am a member. Um, can you please comment on the chirality of, um, of biomolecules or, or organics and sort of the distribution, symmetric or asymmetric? What, what do you expect and you know, is there some indication, some signature of life that would be associated with a chirality? So uh, the last time I did any reporting on this, um, the answer was yes, that chirality is potentially an indication of biology given, and by chirality we mean molecules that have handedness, so some of them are left-handed and some of them are right-handed and how the um, atoms are organized, and this is a terrible thing for me to be explaining because I actually am really bad with left and right, <laughs> so unless I do this, it's kind of a crapshoot which way I'm gonna go. Um, and life on Earth is handed, it's, it's picked aside. And so generally, if you were looking at a completely random mix of molecules, you would expect to see a mix of chiralities, but that's not what we see in biological systems here. And so the question is, if you see something like that, and correct me if I'm paraphrasing your question wrong, but if you see something like that, would that be an indicator that there is some kind of biological process at work? And I think, a lot of people would say, yes, that's, a, that's like a good step in the right direction on its own, it's not enough. Is, is what my understanding of, of where that thinking is. I, I believe that's a really good description. And it, actually, there are observations of breakage of symmetry between the two, uh, ha, you know, handness on Mars uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, curiosity. There's it's kind of a paper that's out there, and uh, people have been talking about it. Now, basically, uh, the, by the way, the same is true with methane observations on intermittent methane observations of Mars. If you were on the Earth, the by far the largest likelihood for those kind of things to arise would be in the context of life. Uh, you know, and, and the question is, you know, whether it's plants and so forth, but, but there are also things you can imagine and they immediately flooded the 
uh, publications, right? Things you can imagine that would create kind of, if you want, fake those signatures. So the discussions uh, that are happening on the Mars data, I mean, the, the observations are out there. I think very high quality observations. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, the discussions really are, can we exclude other, other, uh, other, uh, other reasons? I think um, the authors of that 2018 paper, when they were considering potential biosignatures, they said that life is the last resort hypothesis. Um, so you rule out everything else before you get there. Uh, and so I think that's why we're, you know, we're talking about chirality. You also mentioned the distribution of molecules, and that is something that people are thinking about as well. But again, a step, in an, an intriguing step, an intriguing observation, but on its own, um, almost certainly not enough. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a member. Of the things coming up, uh, what looks promising for answering some of the questions? So I really do believe do that do? the James Webb Space Telescope right now in the next year, this year, the next uh, two years are, is going to be the biggest leap in it just because the tool set, the tool is so incredibly powerful. And, and uh, if you, uh, Larry, if you have not had a speaker here, I, I really uh, hope kind of as you look at after one year, of data, you really get a speaker. I mean, it, it is stunning what is what is being found. I mean, it just it takes your breath away. So I think it that's the the most important uh, leap. I think if you looked at it at the time scale of a decade, uh, you know, and, and now you start a little bit, uh, you know, uh, going back and forth. I think uh, some of these uh, planetary missions are going to provide the biggest leaps you know, for more of the in situ work. Uh, Mars sample return being one of them, uh, but also Clipper. Uh, Clipper will launch in 24. So, so basically, it will take a while to get there, by the way, you know, uh, uh, you know to, just because of the orbit dynamics. But, uh, but uh, there's important uh, kind of constraints. You know, for example, we, we don't know. We have some uh, papers in Nature or Science, I forgot, uh, on uh, on uh, Europa with the Hubble Space Telescope that basically say that there's a tentative observation that Europa, like Enceladus, is spurting water into the yeah. environment. Now, I, I mean, I talked to some of these authors and their critics. I, I would just, uh, frankly, like to see Webb looking at this. And I'm sure you've taken the observations. We haven't seen the results yet, uh, or we'll soon take it. But then once we're in orbit, if there's really organics coming out at Clipper, and I mean, frankly, I remember uh, mass spec got into trouble when we uh, were there. And I was told the mass spec is not in the Takeda recommendation. So you can cancel it. And I basically, uh, we tried everything to keep the mass back there because I'm betting, I basically told everybody, I'm betting right now the biggest historic leap will be from that mass spec. Because if it spurts out these organics, we have the right mass spec. It's a two orders of magnitude better than anything we've ever seen. Uh, that mass spec will be the leap. So I would say, uh, James Webb, if it's the next two years, if it's 10 years, it's some of these planetary things. How would you have answered? Um, uncharacteristically, I would have said maybe Mars sample return. <laughs> 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 it's true. The samples that we've, um, we've, not me, your teams, have collected on Mars, well, the rover has collected, um, do seem very intriguing. And I think that Mars sample return is the best way to answer um, the question about whether life ever evolved on Mars, which we don't know the answer to yet. but. Yeah, I think that's that's where it is. Do you expect any surprises from Osiris Rex? Yes. <laughs> In terms of life? Look, I mean, let me just tell you, we went to Bennu. This is a chondritic type of uh, body. Nothing that special. The only thing that's really special is the likelihood of hitting the Earth is one of the highest. Uh, which is still very small, uh, over 100 years, less than about one percent over 100 years. So it's, so you should not worry about it, you know, tonight. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, so we went there. Went I, into I orbit really wasn't. <laughs> we went there into orbit, and it was an active body. It emitted, it emitted, you know, asteroid material like ice, and kind of. It also had 
water uh, there, kind of that was discernible. And none of this, and then kind of the, the, the overall uh, organic uh, kind of composition uh, surprised the, 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 uh, the team. So the body itself, Bennu already surprised, and in at least three of the core areas. So when the samples are going to come back, I mean, I, I mean, I'm giddy just to, to see uh, what's happening there. Just, you look at the Japanese mission, Hayabusa, Hayabusa too, too. You know, and I, I've read some of these papers, and, and also there, frankly, the, the richness of the, the chemical uh, kind of evol kind of the chemical components. I mean, I, I mean and frankly, when I when I saw the the uh, Carina Nebula, right, I called up the comet, uh, my comet friends, is like, hey, like. Go connect the pieces, right? Get yeah. off the, the, the richness is so much higher uh, here also. So there will be surprises. Of course, I'm, I'm wrong on guessing what they will be. Well, spoiler, we should be having a talk on Hayabusa 2 uh, in the fall. Uh, yes, Aki Birch, member. Um, so I wanted to ask the sort of astrobiologist party game question and that um, who's going to find life first, inside the solar system or outside the solar system? Oh. <laughs> we had a lot of uh, arguments in, in the headquarters in specific rooms about this, and uh, nobody ever won. <laughs> what, what do you think? I mean, I, I actually, my, my bet was always outside the solar system, frankly. And the simple reason is just we have more shots on goal. Just, I mean, frankly, if we have the right machine, but we need to build that machine. So if you say first, right, kind of if, if it, life is quite abundant everywhere, uh, the planetary people will win uh, just because they can build it faster than uh, we can build the habitable worlds observatory. Once we're there, uh, they're just, there's more shots on goal. So that, that's, how, that's how I would say. So, but uh, what are the of terms course, I don't know. Bet? What are you willing to bet on that? <laughs> His car. <laughs> I already lost it in a previous bet. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say I lied. That wasn't the last question. We have another question from the blue microphone. Uh, Robert Thompson, I am a member, and I'll make this quick because I know we're at the end here. But uh, given that, basically, as far as we know, n equals 1, and given the presence of extremophiles and things like this, has anyone tried to place place bounds on L. Basically, how long do we have? <laughs> um, yes. So L has been debated quite a bit. And um, it's important to remember that as I has um, defined in the context of the equation, it's an average. So by definition, you need more than one example, um, which makes that tricky. And so I think a lot of the work that's been done looking at L, at least on like an Earth planetary scale, it's a really interesting thought exercise, but it doesn't really inform the answer to the Drake equation L, if that makes sense. Did I even answer your question? <laughs> well, I wanted to know how long we've got. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, that's probably up to all of us. <laughs> so I, I'm going to close with a kind of question but pose it as a, a proposition, which is, I think a central tenet of science is that there's this continuum. Physics is consistent with chemistry, is consistent with biology, and the rules of these things are the same throughout the universe. So if we flip it around and ask the question, how much of a bottleneck will be required to have a sufficient improbability of life developing anywhere else in the entire universe. And the subsidiary question is, we know that fragments of Mars have ended up on Earth, and fragments of Earth have ended up on Mars, and so there is communication among the various bodies in the solar system, and doesn't that change the equation of life, not so much being an origin, but life being communicated amongst the bodies in the solar system in a way that we didn't think of before. The same way we didn't know there were that many planets, and we didn't think that moons could possibly be habitable. So I guess that's a very long-winded, violating my rule to ask a question. <laughs> but I'm asking for a comment on that. Well, look, uh, 
I would have guessed that uh, if life is found on Mars, it would be, I would not be, many people, not just me, would not be surprised if it's related in some way to the life on Earth. I think it would be very hard to explain such a relation if it was found just dynamically, if it was found in Europa or in Enceladus. So what's exciting about looking at these other worlds is that it really, truly, just from the dynamics point of view, is, is very likely a different genesis from the, you know, kind of crossing that chasm from the physical chemical world into the biological world, whereas uh, with Mars, that may not be the case. So I, I really do believe, uh, you know, that I mean, that, that's being discussed actively. Uh, frankly, it, a lot of it depends, of course, how long life can live, right? Some of these uh, objects that take off from Mars and come back to Earth and vice versa, they're actually in space quite a long time, right? They're not going on home on transfers, right? Because they don't have boosts and stuff, right? So kind of it, it takes, you know, it takes a while from Mars in, you know. Very saying, hostile environment. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's a bad environment because you get radiated from all environment, from all sides, so it's a, it's a bad environment. But uh, uh, I think it's a, a thoughtful point, right? Kind of uh, finding life near Earth is very likely less, uh, potentially less transformative than finding life really far away. Um, I can address your first question, which is about uh, you know, how big would the bottleneck have to be to explain what an, a no observation is. A negative, yeah, a negative, negative result. Right, so... Um, as a hypothetical proposition. As a hypothetical proposition, because we're never going to prove a negative. Um, there was a paper that was published recently that did that used climate modeling to look at the impact of a potential um, subsurface uh, biosphere on Mars, uh, methane producing microbes, and how those microbes might modify the Martian climate as their biomass flourished. And what the paper found was that those microbes were actually their own worst enemies. They changed the planet's environment in such a way that they made it basically inhospitable for themselves to survive. And so what those authors are proposing is something called, um, it's related to the idea of a Gaian bottleneck. So it might not be uncommon at all for life to arise, but it might be that in the majority of environments that you see life, it actually works to destroy itself before it can evolve to something that we might be able to find. Yeah, the flip side of that is, uh, and I'll be quiet after this, I promise, um, is the origin of life on Earth and how many times did it happen? And people have not been able to find any convincing evidence it happened more than once. But that's because it probably disappeared, was outcompeted. Or I shouldn't say probably, it's, it's a possibility. Yeah, and the interesting thing, so these authors were comparing um, Earth and Mars because the idea was that life on Earth and Mars um, originated at the same time. And they said the major difference in the evolutionary pathways of the two planets had to do with the composition of the atmosphere. So Mars just got unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, hopefully we'll be lucky and persist for a very long time in some form or other. And I thank you both very much for giving this talk. And before you go, resurrecting an old tradition that was suspended during COVID, I have for each of you a signed copy of the announcement of your talk, uh, signed by all the members of the general committee. Thank you. And I also have, and there's two, so each gets one. I also have for you a copy of volume one of the Bulletin of the Philosophical Society of Washington, in which you will find uh, who the original members were, why they founded the society, and um, why they called it Philosophical Society. You'll also find a very interesting article on how to calculate pi to three decimal places. <laughs> and uh, with that, I thank you so much. The nice. fourth lecture will be the 2472nd lecture, and it will be on February 17th, the speaker will be Richard Hansen of Idaho State University. He will be speaking on the extensive Maya network of roads, towns, and cities discovered by High Lidar and his archaeological work there in efforts to preserve the remains of these remarkable Greek classical civilization and one of the last remaining virgin rainforests in Central America. 
Rich's work has recently been reported on in Science, Smithsonian Magazine, and the Wall Street Journal. The 2473rd meeting will be on March 3rd. The speaker will be announced on the web. The 2474th meeting will be on March 17th. The speaker will be Walter Harris of the University of Arizona. And guess what he'll be speaking about? Comets. On uh, the 2475th meeting will be on March 31st, and the speaker will be Jonathan Glossos of Washington University. He'll be speaking on his experiments and studies on evolution in isolated island populations and their broader implications. We will be announcing the speaker for April 14th in due course. The 2,477th meeting will be on April 28th. The speaker will be Amanda Poldani of Cal Poly. And she'll be speaking about Mesopotamian life and findings of their early civilizations in Mesopotamia deduced from the reading of ancient cuneiform tablets, of which there are hundreds of thousands, many waiting to be translated. So there may be a task for AI. But it's uh, very interesting to read about the lives of people in the earliest known civilizations that they were not really a lot different from ours in many respects. 2478th meeting will be on May 19th. It will be the annual Joseph Amy Lecture. The topic will be about building habitat on the moon. And we have several speakers. Daniel Inesene, who is senior space architect at Blue Origin, Sebastian Despella, who's the CEO of Think Orbital. Eleanor Morgan is the space architect and program manager at Lockheed Martin. Xavier de Zestelia is space architect and head of design at Hassel Architects. And Melody Yasser is a researcher, technology, and director of building design at ICON. Some of you may know ICON is a company that builds housing by printing it with concrete. So they have a giant inkjet type printer out of which comes concrete and they build up habitats um, the way a 3D printer works to build objects. And the 2480th meeting will complete the spring lecture series on June 16th. The speakers will be Bill Barrow. Ah, sorry. Excuse me, I skipped somebody important. The 2479th meeting will be on June 2nd. They're all important. The speaker will be Sean Carroll, currently at Johns Hopkins University. He'll be speaking on a topic in contemporary theoretical physics. I'm sure many of you know Sean from his many books and video presentations, and maybe from some of his scholarly articles, too. The 2480th meeting will complete the spring lecture series on June 16th. The speakers will be Bill Merrill and Sam Brody of Texas A&M University, and they'll be speaking about the $30 billion Ike Dyke project being planned to control rising tides and water surges that threaten to engulf Houston in flooding and storm damage, one of the largest civil engineering projects being contemplated in the United States. Please check the PSW website often for up-to-date information on meetings. Finally, let's thank our crew. Camille Lance, Robin Taylor, Robert Thompson, Jared McLean. <laughs> Ann McQueen and Bill Mitchell hasn't done anything yet because he will edit the video. Speaking of crews, if any of you would like to volunteer to help, the society carried out its work and in particular help with running these meetings, please let me know. Otherwise, I will accept a motion from a member to adjourn the meeting. And I'll take a second. All members in favor? Aye. All members opposed? Aye. Who? Somebody's opposed? Too bad. <laughs> the meeting is adjourned to the social hour.